And now, Daljit Dhaliwal. Russia's gas flows may have resumed to Europe, but relations between the EU, Ukraine and Russia remain frosty. Here to shed some light on the political tensions surrounding the recent gas dispute and what it means for Europe's energy future is former Swedish diplomat Anders Asland. He's currently a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C. Anders, welcome to Foreign Exchange. Thank you. So let's rewind a little bit. Talk for a moment about who you believe instigated this dispute and the likely motivations. I think that there were two instigators. One was uh, Gazprom Russia and the other was Rosso Crinergo with the shady intermediary that wanted to continue skimming off money on the Russian-Ukrainian gas trade. And that's a Ukrainian company or a Russian company? It's half owned by Gazprom and it's half owned by uh, Ukrainian individuals who are supporting the opposition in Ukraine. So what role then did corruption play? Well, uh, Rosso Krinerko, this intermediary, uh, siphons off at least $1 billion from uh, this gas trade. And uh, Rosso Krinerko was uh, afraid of being squeezed out, as indeed uh, it was in the end. And therefore, it didn't want to have an agreement. So what effect has this um, row had on Gazprom's reputation as a supplier of energy? Being disastrous. It shows that uh, Gazprom did not care about its customers. The uh, complaints about Ukraine were pretty flimsy. The so-called theft was uh, tiny amounts that uh, could have been uh, natural losses in the pipelines in any case. And Gazprom did not try to get uh, an agreement very soon. And we saw in the end that it was Prime Minister Vladimir Putin who settled it, who showed that he's the real CEO of Gazprom. So Gazprom doesn't look as a commercial company at all, but it looks as uh, an instrument for state intervention in foreign policy and uh, for corruption. Well, how would you um, assess uh, Prime Minister Putin's personal involvement? I mean, at times, you know, it seemed like his resolve and the language that he was using was a little reminiscent of the, the way he kind of conducted himself over the conflict with Georgia. What was going on? What were the underlying political dynamics there? Well, uh, what obviously comes out is that uh, Prime Minister Putin is uh, the dominant force uh, in Russia. And this is both uh, positive and uh, negative. But we can see from the actual agreement that that was exactly what they were discussing on New Year's Eve. So here, more than two weeks of disrupted gas deliveries uh, to Europe uh, uh, took place for no good reason whatsoever. So why did Moscow want to antagonize the Ukraine? Uh, it's difficult to say what was really the reason. Clearly there was an interest to maintain this corrupt uh, uh, agreement that, that they had. Another reason was probably to try to destabilize Ukraine and certainly to whip up uh, Russian nationalists uh, so that Russians would react against uh, the Ukrainians rather than against uh, their own government. And but did it have the desired effect in Moscow? Uh, the popular support for uh, uh, the government, uh, for Russia in this conflict, was whipped up. That was the one positive effect, but all the other effects for Russia are really negative. And what about the domestic considerations that were at play for Ukraine? Uh, well, here, uh, Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko was very interested in getting uh, rid of this intermediary, Rosso Krinergo, because it supported mainly the big opposition party, uh, the, the regions of Ukraine, which represents eastern Ukraine, and also provided some sort, according to Yulia Tymoshenko, to the president uh, secretary, that is, President uh, Viktor Yushchenko. Mm. So if Putin miscalculated um, and Moscow's attempts at playing hardball with Ukraine have failed. I mean, you mentioned the, the kind of impact that this is having on Russia's foreign policy. What, what, what exactly are the implications of that? 
Well, the big implication would be that uh, the European Union finally comes together and gets a Russia policy and an energy policy which is not in Russia's interest because Russia prefers to deal with uh, uh, 27 members of the European Union as uh, single entities and not as one union. Mm. Is the European Union any closer to resembling something that looks like a common energy policy? Yes, it is. Somewhat uh, uh, closer. Uh, in two regards. When there was a settlement in uh, Moscow, uh, or before the settlement, the European Union sent its energy commissioner rather than a lot of different uh, ministers. And the person who clearly told uh, Mr. Putin uh, what the situation was, was uh, German Chancellor Ang uh, Angela Merkel. And uh, Germany is the biggest uh, importer of uh, uh, Russian gas within the European Union. And just briefly, the contours of this deal that have been worked out between R Russia and Ukraine, do you think that it's durable? I think this is uh, durable because it is a long-term agreement for 11 years and it has a clear uh, price formula and it, uh, it has been published and it looks like a normal commercial agreement. So there is nothing funny in it uh, as has been the case previously when one thing or the other is only determined for half a year. Okay, well thank you very much for joining us in the programme and uh, giving us your insights. Thank, thank you. you.